All right, how's it going, you guys? <clears throat> uh, welcome for those of you that are jumping in right now. Uh, just going to be doing a bit of a session here to get going for um, a preemptive to registration that's going to be beginning for my classes for this upcoming uh, term. So I just wanted to kind of take a moment to jump on board and discuss things with people that wanted to um, have questions or you know uh, interact a little bit. Um, I will be sketching a little bit in my sketchbook that pertains to my fantasy journal, but like I said, I'll be discussing a couple things about my classes and stuff like that for registration. Um, in the meantime, I've already been kind of thinking about what I'm going to be sketching here, and uh, it is going to pertain to, like I said, the biology journal that I've been kind of building up to this point, and uh, I have a collection of fossilized fish that I wanted to bring for inspiration, so I'm going to be using this a little bit here um, as a part of a jumping off point. So. Let me just grab the right pen that I can use here. And I might be, well, no, most likely we'll be bringing in some watercolor as well, too. Okay, so uh, just to set this up, let me just talk about what I'm going to be using for materials. So later on, when people want to um, watch the recording on Twitch, they can uh, get a sense of you know what's going on in the beginning. I won't repeat this all the time, but I'll just kind of bring it up when people ask questions, though. Uh, I'm going to be drawing with the Pigma. FB as always. I do also have my uh, Euchre's felt tip pen. I also have a um, unnamed Kuretake uh, kind of felt tip pen as well too, refillable. And I do have my water brushes for the uh, watercolors coming up later on. Uh, in terms of how long I'm going to be on, probably about two hours, I want to have two hours or so. Um, I'm going to possibly go back to a previous page. Uh, that I've already started a couple of pieces that like fruits and stuff like this uh, that the characters I'm going to gathering, but also just to kind of uh, I guess bring everybody on to the same page as to what we're doing right now. Uh, this journal that I'm starting up at the moment started off with the character uh, which I named Larut An, so that's the character, and uh, he's kind of keeping this journal where he travels throughout this island that he discovers, this unmanned or uh, uncharted island. And he's going around collecting biological samples and recording data, basically. So a lot of it is biological in terms of animals, flora and fauna. Uh, and right now at the moment, he's traveled through this island, and I've gotten him into the eastern location at this point. So the last entry with color was actually the predatorial piece, um, which he discovered on the eastern side of the location. So instead of keeping <laughs> uh, and staying in the location, he decided to move forward back up north. But I'm probably going to have him stop by this kind of like cove-like area right there. Kind of a water section because I wanted to do an entry pertaining to fish, so which I haven't done just yet. I think a lot of the stuff I discovered have been things like insects and, you know, flora and reptiles and, you know, some mammalian animals as well too. But I haven't really gone into fish just yet, which I really want, like to do. So um, what I'm probably going to go for here is uh, jumping onto this side. Actually, you know what? I gotta just check out one thing real quickly. I just have to make sure that I'm streaming on Twitch. Because <laughs> if I'm not just yet, then uh, it'll be a bit of a problem. So give me one second, you guys. As I double check. <clears throat> okay, good. I'm on. Great. So, uh, let's see. What I'm going to do here real quickly is uh, just update people again is that I'm going to be going into the section of the waters. I'm going to basically have the character go fishing and he's going to basically pull up, you know, many different assortments of animals that I will then document and I'll be doing essentially kind of like studies almost like I use this as mainly for inspiration. Uh, you know, this is like fossilized fish and something I purchased uh, a couple of years ago at a uh, shop and, um, you know, some of these fish are millions of years old and they're locked in this kind of like uh, slate. So you start to see some really great details here in terms of like some of the old fossilized fish and the bone structure and the shape language and the silhouettes and you know proportioning and the size and scale of the animals as well too compared to like my hand and you know just general information about them and of course modern day animals and fish as well too that I can pull from just based on the assortment of visual memory that I have over the many years of drawing. So uh, I'll be using this as a side kind of piece and uh, again like I said I'll be using my memory uh, to generate. Uh, designs of different kinds of animals like fish that I can. The last entry that I also created on my own time was uh, basically just collections of fruits. So I just like one weird like chameleon type of, type of animal like collecting fruits and stuff like this. I was inspired by fruits that I had in my own backyard. So I decided to kind of like put together a few um, samples, but I'm going to color these later on. But we'll go into a new page here and we just start sketching and drawing. 
uh, going into fish-like creatures. So before I even do so, what I want to do actually is re recreate the map over here in terms of where he's at the new location because in the last couple of pages I haven't really gone back into the map to show people where he is. Then I'm also going to design an actual fishing rod, a compact fishing rod over here. Then I'm going to actually do assortments of fish down here. So generally uh, when I'm doing stuff like this I'm already thinking about like a location of like where things are going to go in terms of drawing and then once I've made some decisions uh, as to like what I'm going to draw then I'm going to go into um, the different parts of like you know the details of these things thanks for the uh comment jay yeah the move is still happening at the moment i moved to a new location uh in terms of like a living space so it's been quite the ordeal because i had so much stuff collected over the years so processing all that and getting into the boxes and moving it on my own has been quite the um i'm sure everybody understands moving can suck anyways i wanted to bring this map up just to like remind me as to like where i was so I'll be kind of flipping back and forth on this one. So again, he was located down here at the moment. And he's going to be traveling up into this area right in there. So I just want to recreate the map just ever so simply. Right down in this section. A little bit more zoomed in. And I'll probably create a frame around this just so I can make it feel more secure under the page. And again, I'm using the uh, Pigma FB pen to kind of start a lot of my sketches. This will help me dictate also just the relative size, scale of the drawings, location, all that kind of stuff uh, from this small little islands I'm going to put in there. And because we're zoomed in, I'm going to start to even show, reveal, you know, more finer details of things where this is just more of a generalization. Um, so we had things like vegetation, forest area over here. Uh, he had started in this location, moving up into this spot. So here in the eastern location of the island is where he found some of the predatorial animals. Uh, much more volcanic structuring of rocks is what I was kind of thinking of in terms of environment. But here we're going to try to show a bit of a cove or like waterways and stuff like this. So maybe I'll have even the idea of like a river system coming down here. I know this is not as visually interesting at the moment, but we'll get into it real soon. Uh, something like this is just more for the uh, sake of the book in terms of storytelling, but also just for context for people as they look back on a journal like this one here and so that we can kind of follow along with the journey of this individual. I will be taking a qu couple questions here and there on Twitch. So for those of you that are uh, watching me on Instagram, if you ha haven't looked at my stories, you will want to jump on my Twitch stream to ask questions because my um, phone is over to my left over here so I can't necessarily peek over all the time. Um, I'm trying to relegate all questions into one location which is going to be on my Twitch stream. So jump on there under Peter on Style. Uh, you'll be able to find it free just to watch and then you guys can ask questions there. So it's not like I'm trying to avoid you guys on Instagram right now. It's just that um, I'm trying to allocate my focus into one area. Okay, so that should be good. Uh, this is going to be the island location. What I'm going to do now at this point, I'll put down notes in terms of writing a couple of spots here and there. What I want to do now is like design out the actual uh, fishing rod. And I had an idea, a concept in my head about the fishing rod itself. I didn't want him carrying around like a giant pole and stuff like this. I want him to carry around like a compact, like collapsible, mod like a modular version of one. Uh, and they're like collapsible and like very compact fishing rods that are out there for sale in reality but I want to design one as well too and then in my head for some reason I imagined a scorpion's tail and how a scorpion's tail can like curve inwardly uh, kind of like a fern as well too a fern's a good idea and how a, a fishing rod can unravel like a whip almost and um, so I kind of want to start with the actual rod handle now this is not really designing per se because I'm not going through the process of you know, uh, fine-tuning or whittling it down to the best iteration. So I wouldn't call this a design process. Uh, this is more of a, a an idea that I've had, and from that idea, I'm generating my first initial kind of thought. So I wouldn't consider it like the best iteration based on this idea. I'm thinking of the handle, and I want to kind of imagine as if this is the gear system in here. 
the actual Rio will be on the other side. I'm going to do the collapsed iteration first. Again, Scorpion's tail is kind of what I was thinking about. Put a bit of a texture on the handle. Side view. For a fishing rod. Putting a little bit of note right in there just for the sake of the feel of the journal. I'll come back and start to add more, you know, um, detail indications, stuff like this. Right now, just more about general placement of stuff. Uh, what I want to do is a secondary iteration. And this time, what I'm going to do is recreate the drawing. I'm going to have it opened up. I'll try to match it as close as I can. I probably won't make it exact one to one just because of human error and uh, mistakes that can happen just from drawing. But that's okay, as long as it's close enough. I kind of have this loophole for the index finger. This curved handle. And I'm imagining the pole now revealed open. Showing the arrow for the action in terms of how it unravels. Then the string would be pulled out from the gear system. So now I have the ideas down in terms of location, what he's using as a tool. This just continues to give the people looking through the, the journal as context as to what's actually happening. I could just draw a bunch of fish, but you know, as interesting as it might be for me to create for people, it's like, yeah, it's a bunch of cool looking fish, but you know, what is he actually doing? So when you start to incorporate, you know, props, uh, text, graphic layouts, uh, world building, that kind of stuff, in, in any sort of projects that you build for yourself, uh, it really helps kind of like solidify its almost be believability to a degree. Uh, even if it's not necessarily like the best visual or the most incredible well-drawn thing, uh, it, it, it's just more of anything that brings people into the world a little bit. So that's what I'm trying to do in this situation, uh, where I'm trying to show that it's not just about drawing pretty fish right now. Um, let's see. I see a couple of questions right now at the moment. Uh, Justice Hicker's asking, been a while, yeah. Side question, how did you begin to pick up archery? Um, so I had a friend, Maru Carrasco, uh, Manu is a friend of mine who I travel with a lot. You know, I went to Africa with him, different parts of uh, Yellowstone. I'll be actually going back to Yellowstone in May with him. Uh, he is an artist who's worked in entertainment for many number of years. You can find him on Instagram and stuff like this. Great animal wildlife artist. Uh, he works over at Cool Clothing. So we just got to know each other from, from Comic-Con in San Diego. Uh, we became good friends and, and travel buddies. Uh, and he's really into, you know, the outdoors and stuff like this. And we will talk a lot about other things and archery is just one of them. I've always had an interest in archery in general. Uh, so I kind of wanted to start it up because of the whole quarantine, not really going anywhere. So I had a relatively large enough backyard where I could set up something. And then I also wanted to play with a lot more of the, the Asian bows. Because, you know, I'm very familiar to the whole Mediterranean style of shooting and that kind of stuff. But the Asian style of like horseback shooting was really new to me. I didn't really understand it. So like anything, when there's curiosity, I kind of want to dive deeper into it. So now I'm shooting almost, you know, every other day in my backyard uh, using, you know, Mongolian style bows and Korean style bows. Uh, we're using a thumb draw. So it's a lot of fun. It's just more recreational than anything else. Nothing as, you know, serious or anything like that. Let's see. Uh, what notebook am I using? This is a book that I found in, um, not in Austria. There was a book sketchbook that I bought in Austria, but it's from the same company. 
Oops, you shouldn't see that one. Check. <laughs> uh, this is a company called Kunst and Papier, and they're based, I believe, in Austria. No, it might be in Denmark. Um, but anyways, this is the company, the brand, Kunst and Papier. And uh, I've had several of their sketchbooks over the many number of years, and I actually like their books quite a bit. Uh, this is a perfectly bound book, nicely stitched. It's got the case bound on it. And um, the paper itself is relatively thin, but it handles watercolor well, even though it buckles a little bit as I do it. Once it dries out, I lay it flat. Eventually, it starts to kind of flatten out itself. So I actually, I'm actually quite fond of their brand. Question is, uh, am I also working on book two of The Blacksmith? I will be, actually. Very soon, hopefully, by this year. Uh, Dynamic Bible Volume 2 will come out by the end of this year. Uh, Blacksmith Volume 2 will hopefully be out by next year. So I'll be spending this year potentially working on it. I'd like to be able to start sometime in, in the summer. JD Mai is asking, for self-studying art, do you have any tips on working, uh, studying for longer while staying energized and motivated? Uh, I tend to lose momentum and get distracted no matter how hard I try to stay on task. It's a good question. Um, it, it's a difficult one for many young people who are just beginning to develop their skill sets uh, because, you know, in, in your mind, the idea of time investment is a huge aspect of building the skill of artistry, you know, drawing, painting, digital, whatever the case may be. And it seems that, you know, that seems to be the case where many artists, as they explain their history and their past, that it seems to be common that we would spend a large amount of our time from youth to adult stage, from schools and colleges, just an exorbitant amount of time, just day in, day out working. Um, but not only that, but, you know, even on our own time, as we, like even for myself, this isn't necessarily work, you know, this is me doing it for fun. You know, I enjoy putting these pages together. Am I eventually gonna turn it into something that could be a product and something that can, you know, put together as an actual thing to sell? I mean, yeah, that's always a potential, but it's not necessarily the ultimate goal. Uh, if something starts off really well and there's interest, then of course I carry it to that direction. But in the beginning of it, it doesn't really have that intention to begin with. Um, then, of course, you know, as I have the idea and the concept, you know, how do I maintain this motivation to stick with it? You know, I started this book, what, sometime at the end of last year or middle of last year. And, you know, it's so far how many pages I've gotten into it, about half of the book at the moment. So, and, you know, consistently producing pages for this world and journal. You know, how do I also stay motivated to stick with one thing, right? Don't I get bored by it? Or is it possible to, um, you know, even in a single sitting, right? It's like, as I'm doing this for hours on end, how, how would you be able to maintain the energy to draw? Um, of course, you know, one of the, the straightforward answers is the discipline built up through training, right? Time and patience, as most artists will tell you, practice. So the more you do it, the more familiar you get used to the scheduling, the time investment, the amount of mental practice and also the physical demands behind it. Drawing can be physically demanding in actuality. It can be, if anything, even physically dangerous. Uh, this kind of adds to the question from Arthur over here. Uh, do you have any tips on dealing with hand pain? Sometimes I had to take days off because I'm worried about injuring myself. And that's a, a great question that adds on to what we're doing over here is because um, drawing is physically you know like i said an endurance game where it's like a marathon it's not high impact sport but it's a long-term process where you're sitting there for long periods of time not moving a lot of, and you might think well because you're not moving it must be easy right well in actuality it's still just as dangerous for your body because our bodies aren't really meant for this kind of stuff we're not supposed to be sitting for a long period of time uh in one single sitting so this is why we have a lot of back pains neck pains hand pains that kind of stuff and in my youth I dealt with a lot of neck pain. I uh, never really had any issues with my hand, with my wrist, or my forearm, thankfully. But it's always been in my neck. And it's because of prior injuries, but also because of how much time I was spent sitting here drawing. Now, right now, as I'm drawing, you'll, you'll notice on the webcam, I don't lean in or twist or turn my body. I'm pretty much square shoulder looking down. Uh, but when I was younger and as a student, I would lean my head all the way down, and I will actually rest on my left arm, leaning inward to see where I'm going. Uh, and I, as I would lean in, I would stay there for four, five, six, seven hours. You know, I know that I just kind of threw a bunch of numbers at you, but you know, it, it varies from sitting to sitting. But minimally, it was four to five hours, if not, and then of course more so. Um, 
Would I take breaks in between? Once in a while, but in most cases, I'd be sitting there trying to do as much work as possible. So over time, I built up a lot of strain in my neck, uh, a lot of muscle pain, uh, pinches, you know, uh, what do they call those? Uh, pinches, right? And the nerves and stuff like this. So I used to have a lot of horrible neck pain when I was in my 20s at Art Center. Um, to overcome it, I just started working out more after school, you know, so uh, after I graduated, I had more time to be able to take care of my body, but during the time when I was in school, I didn't have time to go to the gym, so I would just, I paid for it, horrible pain, waking up, not being able to move, going to the hospital sometime, getting Demerol shots, muscle relaxants, because I wouldn't be able to actually physically get up, it would be so painful, it would lock up a couple seconds, re release, and lock up again, it would do that for the entire day, um, so dangerous. I would literally have a crooked head like this coming out of heart center because I couldn't straighten it out. Uh, it was there was so much more strain on this side of the neck. Um, to this day, I sometimes still have a slight. It's easy for me to pull the muscles on this side over here, um, but thankfully I don't have as much issues anymore today than than I did years ago. But still, you know that's a huge aspect to it that you have to be mindful of how much time you're spending even doing this kind of stuff. But going back to the idea of motivation. I think for me, I mean, for this situation of the project is because I'm actually highly interested in the subject matter and the topics and the themes and the materials. Uh, of course, the very act of drawing is something I really enjoy as well, too. So it's something I could do for a long period of time. But of course, I will be mindful and stretch it out for maybe two, three hours at most these days. And I always take a break. And if I'm going to draw more, I will definitely come back to it. But I wouldn't necessarily push super heavy into like you know six seven hour periods into one sitting uh, I just wouldn't do that anymore um, I wouldn't even recommend it to students these days so students that I have in my classes I always tell them two three hour stretches take a break step away do something else stretch at the very least come back into it work again you know you can do six seven hours in a day but put a lot of like half an hour breaks in between of two three hour stretches essentially but in terms of motivation you have to find again that interest peak in terms, of, in terms of what you're working on. Now, homework, if you're given it in a project, it's not as interesting sometimes. Like, this is my project, so I'm doing it because I've decided to, you know, develop this on my own. But if I'm given a task, let's say like a project in a classroom, in the beginning I can be enthusiastic, but eventually it can kind of, you know, overstay its welcome. Uh, so I kind of lose my interest and I don't necessarily push as much, don't spend much time. But this is where you have to find some way of making that thing as just as interesting, you know, as anything else you've been developing. Um, how you do that? Well, it takes time to find out what aspect of it that you really want to kind of commit yourself to. And it could be not necessarily, let's say, theme, thematic, or subject. It could be the material. You know, just really interested in drawing a pencil or pen or ballpoint or whatever the case is. So you want to explore that to the nth degree. Uh, it could be the, um, the technique of something. How you build stuff through structure of drawing, be it a figure or animals and vehicles or environments. And taking a class, you, you start to understand how those things are approached. So because you're interested in how you actually do those techniques, you spend a lot of time in those areas. You don't really care about the subject. You don't really care about the material, but you're interested in about the thought process. So there's something always there that can potentially focus you in, in how you can maintain that energy and focus. Then it's just daily routine. It's got to be normalized. You know, to the point where it doesn't feel energy sapping. If anything, in time, it becomes energy gain. So for me, when I draw, I don't lose energy. I don't feel tired at the end of drawing. I feel motivated to draw more, if anything else. I have to just literally stop myself because there's just only so much time in the day. Um, so if I wanted to, yeah, I could maintain drawing for super long periods of time if I really wanted to because I actually like to. Um, but anyways... Hopefully I'm not going way too off subject, uh, but I hope that also helps a little bit on your side in terms of the question. Who was that question from? JD, JD Mai. <clears throat> Red Panda is asking, will, will the later parts of the dynamic Bible go over the human anatomy? Possibly not because I don't necessarily cover human, human anatomy in dynamic Bible or dynamic sketching that is in my class. I might do a consideration of posing or human forms, uh, but not necessarily anatomy. Now, if you don't know the difference, Forms are, you know, shape structures of two dimensions turned to three dimensional. So shape to form. Anatomy is about the actual physiology and the, the biomechanics of the human body, right? The muscles to the bones, the tendons, the, the, you know, all that structure, the joints and everything. But in terms of the forms, I want to understand proportion, the kind of shapes and forms we use to build the human body. Possibly, 
But I don't want to do an anatomy book, you know. Just looking through some of the questions as I'm drawing other kinds of small little animals that this person, uh, later on, who's traveling, has gone to this cove and pool area and he's pulling up some kind of crazy animals. Some that are like shrimps, some that are fish. Some animals will look similar to the ones we have today, but I'm also going to go a little bit more interesting with different kinds of shapes of animals coming up here real soon. Let's try one that's actually going to be really blockish to the front. Small kind of eyes. Peeking down into small fins. I always loved designing fish because I always felt like there was no restrictions in terms of what you could do with them. In nature, they've already been pushed so much in terms of variety of proportioning and shapes. Um, they almost seem, you know, it almost seems infinite in terms of how much you can actually play with them. That's what I loved about marine life and also entomology life. <clears throat> this is something I used to do at, at Art Center as a kid, or not as a kid, but in my 20s. Um, when I was a student, I'd always love to just draw and, and come up with different kinds of fish and animals based on animals that we exist in you know, our own world, but you know, coming up with different ways of combining you know, parts and pieces to them or pushing proportion and shape. Hopefully the audio is okay on Twitch, by the way. The microphone's a little bit farther away, but I hope it's picking it up. And this is a new studio setup, so I finally found the power cable to my camera, uh, which is what's running right now. Here's another crazy looking blocky fish, kind of inspired by a combination of a cow sh cowfish and also the uh, sheep heads, and also the uh, look downs, Pacific look downs. Thank you, Justin Tech. I actually appreciate the feedback. Uh, a couple of the questions from above, I'm gonna go back up a little bit. Zach was asking, if you don't mind me asking, I feel like I know how to draw certain things, such as, the f such as the figure, but when I try to put it down on paper, it doesn't even come out close to how I was imagining. What advice would you give? So the question then is, okay, if I understand this, you, you feel like you know how to draw certain things, such as the figure, but when you try to put it on paper, it doesn't come out the way you want it to. So that comment and question kind of conflict a little bit, because if you're saying you, you feel like you know how to draw these things, I guess the, the idea then is that you understand the, the method and the technique of how to draw them, but I guess what your answer is or question is about more of motor skill, muscle memory, or possibly even the, uh, the control logistic-wise to the tool set onto the paper to be able to express the thought or the visual you have in your mind, whether it's the figure or something else. Um, when it comes to this translation, the bridging of those two things, which is you're not necessarily, let's say, I mean also uh, taking this question as you're not looking at something like a reference photograph or an observational thing of a person, you're kind of imagining it. And that's what you kind of said right now, which is, you know, on how it doesn't come out close on how you were imagining. So in that situation, um, this bridging of the two things of what you see in your, or what you relatively have an idea of in your head to what you want to express down onto the page using whatever tool or format you're using, that's a very hard leap. Of course, you can imagine, right? And I think I'm sure all people here it's obvious. Uh, something you can kind of idea-wise have, have something on your head, it's not always going to come close to what you have on the page. Even to this day, for me, I can have an idea of something, of, let's say, even like a fish. I can even picture one right now in my head in terms of like its exact visual look. And as I draw it, would I be able to transfer over the exact image in my head down to the page? And I will tell you the truth is that it, it won't. It won't come close. Um, it'll be in the same vicinity within its you know visual look but it will not necessarily be the same exact thing uh, and it's because as I'm drawing in my head that image is not necessarily static it's not rock solid it's always fluctuating as a visual like for instance like the eye to the mouth to the fins like I have an idea of like what I generally want to do with it but those things are constantly morphing like scale position you know shape uh, even though I have an idea in my head, 
it's not a it's not a static uh, image that's always going to stay there for long periods of time. I might have one for a second or two or even longer, but eventually your brain will start to morph things because you start to generate new ideas or your memory starts to kick up a little bit. And because of this subconscious feeding of information, that visual in your head starts to also then fluctuate. The problem is you may have had the memory of what that idea was. And again, I might be completely off as to like what you're talking about. But either way, this is something that kind of goes into the idea of drawing from the imagination for me. Is that because I'm being influenced by all this visual library, it's always morphing. Uh, when I put it onto the page, I'm always adapting to it. I'm always moving things around. So as I do so, I'm freely making decisions as to what I want from the sketch. And then there is a sense of relaxation because now I also feel that I'm not locked in to what I had as a memory of what I wanted as a visual from the initial idea, then it's always about how do I continue to adapt to what my brain is trying to feed me, right? Now, if I really wanted something one-to-one -one, um, and it was something as an idea that I really wanted to have, then maybe I would do several thumbnails uh, trying to get closer and closer and closer to exactly what I had in my head before. So what I'm trying to do right now is, is hone it into the truth of what it was as an idea, right? But through a single drawing, you know, of course, for myself right now with these fish, it's always going to be moving around. So let's do another one over here. But um, <clears throat> in terms of any other advice, I mean, a lot of it, of course, will be daily practice. And so that way your, your eye, your brain to eye down to hand, that connection and that relationship between them, the harmony between the movement and the thinking and the seeing will come into play. Balance. Right right now you have an idea, but your hand's not moving the way it wants to. Or you have an idea, but you can't seem to lock in on some of the exact details of certain things because you lack the visual information. So this where, you know, then goes into more practice and goes into more study. Um, and patience, you know, tons of patience. But these are, I'm sure, things that you are already familiar to in terms of what you need to be doing, right? Seems obvious. Going back to Arthur's question about hand pain, by the way, um, do I do anything to restrict that? Uh, taking a lot of breaks, as I said, you know, after two, three hours of drawing, definitely a lot of breaks in between. Uh, doing any sort of like hand, you know, stretching or exercise, even minimally, can be extremely helpful. So I would recommend that. And, you know, you can look it up on even like YouTube and stuff like this. I will give you recommendations about what you can do. And for me, I use a lot of different kinds of like hand exercise tools like the uh, springs um, that have the power uh, grips. I use those. Um, I also use like a lot of mountain climber tools uh, for hand strength and forearm strength. Don't use them as much today as I used to. Um, I need to get back into it. I want some aggressive looking fish also. Let's see, what else you got here question-wise? Artistic Indigestion is uh, asking, just wanted to know if internationals, like Australians, can enroll in the dynamic sketching class that's about to open up later today. Absolutely. I've had many students from Australia. Um, and I've you know done workshops over there. So there are, there's a school out in Adelaide called CDW, uh, Concept Design Workshop, which is awesome. I've been out there for a live event and stuff like this a couple of years ago. I was supposed to be back in Australia last year. Uh, of course, a lot of trips got canceled. I'm hoping to be back You know, when travel opens up again real soon. Um, but in terms of the online class that I teach, absolutely, you are more than welcome. And of course, people internationally in general are welcome. Uh, people that also come from different walks of life in terms of profession or interest and level of skill set are also welcome as well too. I, you know, I can definitely say that having prior drawing knowledge of things like perspective and maybe a little bit of still life possibly a little bit of figure drawing can help a lot in terms of receiving the information but even people that have never drawn before have taken my class even just the last term and they all did really well a lot of it is just about having the open mind to try uh, getting over the fear of performance and then of course having the um, the drive and the passion of interest to do so right
just kind of scrolling through some comments right now. Uh, Butterfly is asking, would you recommend learning to draw from your shoulder? So right now at the moment, my sketchbook is about an A4 size, okay, A4. Maybe a little bit bigger, but it feels like A4. At the moment when I sketch and draw, and this is, this is just more of my recommendation, and I talk about this a lot in my classes, but um, what I'm drawing, my hand, I have a standard writer's grip, okay, like this. So the pen is resting on my middle finger. As all of us who draw a lot, I'm sure you guys have built up calluses, right? The bump. Um, for people that begin how to draw, they don't have this formed up. So drawing actually can also be physically painful just from the pressure of holding the pen. Um, so you have to be careful of that part. You give it some time to build up. I know this in how much in terms of how much it hurts because I'll also draw with my left hand at times. I'm right hand dominant. I'm not ambidextrous, but I will draw with my left hand certain times of the year. And as I draw with my left hand, even with like a short period of time going by, like half an hour, my middle finger will hurt because of the pressure being put on top from the pen. My middle finger doesn't do that here, right? There's no pain. It's all deadened, essentially. Uh, so I have a standard writer's grip. And in terms of drawing, I tend to hold the pen around mid-level to about quarter way through, okay? Back in the day, I used to hold the pen very close to the nib. This is because you want control, but you don't want to do this, all right? The tighter you want control, the stiffer your lines, and you start to lock up. So in actuality, having a bit more distance gives you more freedom of movement and looseness, but you can also see better as to where you're going, right? You don't want to hold it far too back because then it's just like you have no control. It's just, it's just a bunch of gestural lines. So I keep it somewhere in the middle, but this is again my opinion in terms of how I hold the pen. As I draw, uh, my palm to wrist area is connected to the page normally. I don't lift it and draw. It's connected and I draw. And the reason why is because as I have connection to the page, I have context of touch. I can gauge distance from the paper to the pen. Pressure control comes up in the play. So I can do a lot of finger rotation, up and down, pressure, and movement. So um, as I draw with this hand, I can slide along my palm, all right? And this gives me security in terms of movement. Elbow is lifted right now. So when I draw, my elbow is lifted. My elbow is not touching this table just yet. It's slightly lifted up. Shoulder does rotate and move if I have larger movements. For these fish at the moment, because they're small, hand is planted, arm doesn't move, finger movement, right? So a little bit of slide back and forth here and there. Elbow is still lifted for me, all right? Left hand, fish, let's see if we can do one. Um, I'll do a standard, like, basic fish. The thing about drawing with left hand for me is that it requires so much more concentration that it's really hard to talk while I'm doing this. That's okay, we'll give it a try. As you can see, the lines are much shakier. And I learned a lot of things about this one here in terms of drawing left-handed. And what that is, is that there's certain movements that I have restrictions to. I want to move a certain way, but I can't. That movement that I'm talking about is this. I can't really do this with my left hand. Even though with my right, I do a lot of this kind of rotation and back and forth. This gives me a lot of subtlety. With my left hand, it's locked in place. As I'm drawing, I'm doing this. Only when I stop, I try to move a little bit, right? But in combination, a movement like this is really hard to do. So here, as I'm going back into it, I have to stop and reposition and try to move, and it's really hard. And pain is building up here. hand shakes. But what's important is the idea of how I draw my fish is still there. Because um, how I structure them is all the same. So if I understand how to structure the fish and draw the shapes and the placement, 
portion or playing around. Once I train more with my left hand and I build this kind of sense of familiarity and movement, there's no reason why I can't draw my left hand just as good as my right, even though I'm not ambidextrous, even though I'm dominant right-handed. And over time, I get more comfortable with my left hand. It's always the beginning. That first step is like, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. And then I go at it, and all of a sudden you feel a bit more comfortable. It starts to come into play a little bit. It's not the best thing in the world, but to me, it's not about how well I can draw it. It's more about the moment of me doing it. It's fun, right? So I can come back with the right hand, clean things up a little bit. There's times when I'm drawing my left hand and my right is like this. I'm trying to come back and take the pen back. My right hand is like antsy. It's like, give it back to me, you know? Uh, and my left hand's like trying to figure things out. Uh, <laughs> it's like the big brother, the small brother kind of thing. Uh, and so even though I'm not conscious to think of it, my right hand is like fidgeting to like take control. It's like, this is not right. This is not supposed to be this way. And my right hand wants to do it. Uh, but I'm trying to stay control of my left. It's kind of funny. How it, it happens like that and just like, uh, subconsciously where my hand just moves like that then the right hand comes in I can just freely move the way I want to anyway these are fish in terms of size and scale I was thinking of them being small scale fish um, again I have this like fossilized thing so I, I'm thinking of the scale of the fish that he's pulling up to be actually small so using a small rod like that uh, this is like to scale essentially one to one scale Couple questions from above. Last Colonel was asking, what's a real good paper for ink and watercolor? I would say the Strathmore brand uh, watercolor paper. No, I'm sorry, not Strathmore. The Canson, Canson brand, C-A-N-S-O-N. Canson brand 300 series. That watercolor cold press paper is awesome. Let's see, uh, started art later in life. I feel like picturing things in my mind is very difficult. Is this something that I can improve through training or is that just the way my mind works? If I can improve uh, on it, are there any specific exercises you would recommend? Uh, you, need to take you need to take classes on it. You can try to train through yourself by looking at more photographs and copying a photograph, but in that situation, by copying a photo, you can't retain the information as well. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's, it's a longer process. And the reason why is because you're looking at a photo of the copy and you're just responding to it and you're only responding to the surface details, you're not really understanding how to actually build the thing and how that information can be carried over through other subjects similar or even different to it. So taking classes like the one I offer, the dynamic sketching is all about that, how to build the visual library, right? But before you can build that, you gotta know how to see. If you know how to see something, then you understand how to process it. But at the beginning, when you first begin to draw on your own, looking at photographs, you're responding to like every normal person does, which is you see the specifics of details that are in the photograph or in real life. Uh, let's see. When you're at the part of the drawing where you're darkening lines, how do you decide where to darken? Uh, is it mainly just the opposite side of the light source? That's one. Or is there a specific, is there anything else that you can try to keep in mind? I often end up overworking it and getting too dark. For me, that's one recommendation, which is where is the light source coming from? Then the opposite side go darker. Think of it kind of like a shadow side. The other part is focus. Where do you concentrate focus and interest to a drawing? The other part is graphical. You can make it more of a stronger silhouette to stand out from the background. It can separate from overlaps as well too, right here. But it's also aesthetic. Based on you playing with the line and heavy line weights or light line weights, you start to find your aesthetic choice. So it's a combination of all those things. Hey Bowen, how's it going? Uh, took you to dynamic sketching two or three times. Uh, kind of feeling lost now. I don't know if I should take your class again. Well, here's my recommendation. Um, we got to ask the question of why. You know, why are you feeling lost? You know, this is not a question only for Bowen, who's a former student of mine, but this could be a question for a lot of people here. Is that you may have taken a bunch of classes prior, not mine, but someone else's, you know, and um, or you've gone through prior training, even on your own. Look through books and tutorials and videos and you went through like a year of doing this. And now you're sitting there by yourself, behind the computer, in front of all this stuff you've been doing, 
and you're still like thinking to yourself, I don't know what's next, or I'm stuck, I'm lost, I don't know what I should be doing. I've done what I thought I was supposed to do, I've completed it, but now what, right? In those situations, of course, it's very easy to become overly flustered, where it tends to kind of squish the drive and the hunger a little bit for a lot of people. This is where a lot of people tend to kind of give up, right? Um, because it's not because it's too hard, because it's mostly because you don't know where to go. You feel lost. You feel like you're wasting time. You feel like you're wasting money. You feel like you're wasting energy. And you don't like that feeling of losing. You know, you want to gain. So this feeling of, of losing is a, a hard one to overcome because you feel like you need someone to tell you what to do. But I don't think that's necessarily the answer either, you know? But uh, I can understand that's a reality that many people can face at a young age. Even when you're in college, you know, you're actually going through university and system, you can still feel that way as well too. I know because I've dealt with many students who have come up to me like that. After being at an art center for like a year and a half, they'll come up to me saying, I'm lost. I'm at the school and I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what I'm doing, you know? <clears throat> so don't feel like, you know, you're the only one going through this bone. Because as Rimas is also saying, same feelings. That's the one thing first that you have to overcome and realize, which is that you're not the only one, all right? Uh, it's a part of the process. What you are going through is actually very normal. If anything, you have to go through it. I don't think it's necessarily even realistic or even actually quote unquote normal not to have that. If you're going through systems of like school and classes like this, and you're feeling completely okay with everything you're doing, if anything else, more than likely, you're just kind of following a track that's already been laid out in front of you, and you're just kind of copying that pace, you know? Um, and because there's really no second guessing, no challenges, no, nothing to really kind of burn your way through, it's not as, um, like I said, weary of a path. But for someone who's learning on their own, let's say you, whether it's you're, you're at a college or not, and especially for a lot of people right now who are not in systems of schools, they're kind of learning on their own, watching videos, tutorials, going to online classes, you're jumping from one thing to another one. It's very easy to spin yourself around. But at the same time, again, still, you're not the only one going through it, and it's very normal to feel that way. If anything, what you're supposed to be doing is actually, you know, like I said, spreading yourself out to experience as much as possible. Now, that might feel like you're being lost, but the idea is to touch upon many things to see where is it you want to land yourself towards eventually. Like right now, if your thought is, I need to find the path, I need to know what I'm supposed to be doing. I need to understand all the type of classes I need to have. I need to know what kind of portfolio I need to build, what kind of work I need to get. I should know all this stuff right now. Maybe you're like a year and a half, two years in. In my opinion, I don't think that should be the case at all. What you should be doing is discovering more about the field of creativity, of art, of storytelling, of drawing, of painting, whatever the case is, something that pulls your interest in that ways. You spend the time there, you try something else. You think, but I don't want to waste time. But it's not wasting time. The idea is that as you experience all these different things, you start to compare and contrast. Those other skill sets can also be brought in together. You just don't see the long-term effect just yet. You feel as an independent um, experience of it, right? Let's say I'm taking a drawing class, figure drawing. I'm taking another drawing class, dynamic sketching. I'm taking a 3D modeling class. I feel like they're all independent and not really connected together, when in actuality, they can be used as an overall skill set as you are being an artist or designer, right? But it's so troubling because your thought is, I don't know if I should be sticking with this. I, I should be doing figure, right, for like a year and a half more. Or I should be sticking with dynamic sketching for a year period, right, or more than that, right? Or I should be doing modeling. If I want to do modeling, I should just stick with modeling, 3D stuff. But at this early period in time, after a year or two, Bowen or for anybody else, the idea is that you shouldn't necessarily be overly concerned. Even though I say this, you will be, and I understand why, but I will be in the position to tell you, try not to, okay? Because um, in time, you will look back on it and understand why you had to go through that. Because eventually you will hopefully find uh, what it is you're trying to spend most of your energy towards and where all of your emphasis of learning is coming from. At the moment, you don't know. To be honest, I don't even know, you know, so because you have to kind of discover it on your own. So this is the idea of self-discovery. You kind of have to find those answers for yourself. It's scary. It's risky. It feels like, you know, it's not going to 
happen and there's no guarantee of it happening but right now the best way to go about in the future of your education is to make these decisions based on one of course advice from previous instructors which you may have gotten already um, from like-minded people or friends you've already had but then of course coming down to your decision that over there seems interesting I want to try it out go try it right and so if you think well I don't want to waste time well now's the time to do it you can't wait 10 years from now right after going through all the other education maybe you start working and think oh I wanted to try that before it's too late then it's better to do it now and find out right so if you're trying to say that, but I'm trying to find a structured curriculum that I have to follow all the way to the end, again, I recommend against this. Because, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you remember, Bowen, about the talks that I've given in the past, that if you just kind of follow what everyone's supposed to be doing, right, the set path or the set curriculum that all schools give people, you're going to come out with the same kind of thinking process, mentality, artistic style, aesthetics, interest, as everybody else who's being trained the same way. Now, there's no reason why you can't compete and want to work in the same field, but you should offer something more too. And it could be based on then your, let's say, um, drive and interest to kind of spread yourself out further instead of just kind of going the set path. But um, and like I said, I don't have the answer for you. Uh, nobody does. But you do know that you're not quite sure what to do next. And that's a good thing because whatever step you take is the right choice. <laughs> in the field of creativity the wrong choice is not doing anything okay the right choice is doing something and that something could be almost anything it could be if things were easier to travel right now that could be one option well forget art class i'm gonna go travel i'm gonna experience the world a little bit meet people that could be amazing as an artist i actually want to take real drawing classes now i've already taken dynamic sketching i'll take more of this over here but making a choice and moving forward by sitting there by saying i don't know what to take I need someone to tell me what to take. And you don't make a decision. Maybe you don't meet the person that tells you what to do. And you just sit there for another month, you know, two, three months ahead of time. And you haven't made any moves at all. That's the wrong decision. Right? Make a choice even if it's a wrong one. I don't know if that helps a little bit. Um, but I hope it does, Bowen. And of course, like I said, are there options that, you know, in terms of things that can work with me? Absolutely. Because I have these sit-in position classes, right? So I'm not going to tell you this. actually sign up for my class. I actually don't want you to. <laughs> don't sign up for the full class. Don't. You've already done a year of it. You know what we do. But if you want to be in the environment, we'll do the sit-in version of the class, okay? Don't pay the full version of it. Pay the sit-in version. At least you can be in there to be in the environment. If anything, what I want you to do, instead of taking the class, help me with the class. Sign up for the you know, sit-in position seat. Go in there and be like, you know what? I'm here. I'm sitting in the draw with you guys. If anybody wants help, I'll give you some. There's no reason why you can't do that, right? I'm not going to stop you. I would want you to. So that's just a thought, right? The idea is sometimes we can also think of how we can give instead of taking. If you can't find out where to go to take something, well, then think about, well, what can I give now? Just something to chew on, all right? Uh, Bowen, think about that a little bit. Uh, let's see. Uh, if somewhat, if I'm somewhat of a beginner, would you recommend the sit-in seat or the full class? Well, in terms of the, the someone who's just beginning, either option honestly would be good. It's more based on your schedule and your financial means. Okay, um, the schedule would be more important because if your schedule right now is like, oh, I got a part-time job, I have family, it, it's probably better for your sit-in, the sit-in version because you can still be in the environment. You can see how the class is structured and how we work. You can be a part of it. You will still draw. But uh, at least you won't be pressured to just work as hard as possible without really understanding your balance every day to day. Once you get a feel of it, because that sit in position is low risk, then you can say, well, you know what, that class was really interesting, but I really want to get the full version now because I felt like the feedback that I was giving to full people that were in the class signed up was really helpful. I need that as well too. So then you might sign up for the full version, right? Okay, I'm going to do a couple more fish over here. This is a left-hand fish. Uh, I'll call this guy Lefty. Let's draw some more fish out here. 
Uh, I'm gonna do like a long snout mouth. I'm trying to push the body shape a little bit. Kind of small beady eyes. I'm gonna be doing some watercolor on these fish as well too, so that'll bring them more to life. At the moment, it's just line drawing, so they're okay, but with a bit of watercolor, this will start to look better. Just looking for shapes, interesting kind of visual details. Nothing super tightened up just yet. Drawing relatively loose, quick, not rushed, but just with the ease of movement, just discovering. Even if some of them feel somewhat repetitive or familiar, I'm not too worried about that. If anything, I kind of welcome it to kind of get it out of my system. And I'm looking for those last couple ones that I can really start to push more. this one here this will be interesting crazy shape of the head I want these fish to feel somewhat prehistoric almost like Devonian age fish to a degree <clears throat> armored types yet small I want them to be small in scale they're supposed to be like almost one to one as he's catching these small little fish <laughs> in my next couple of uh, setups in the journal I have so many pages still to go through but I actually do want to introduce an indigenous people at some point soon so it's a little bit of a thought process I've been trying to go through in terms of like what I want that to feel like Uh, Wig is asking, is it just practice or is it just, or is it going to be your next dynamic Bible? This, this is just fun. Will I make this into a book? There's been interest, people have been asking for it, uh, but this is just more of a journal book, fantasy journal. But the next dynamic Bible will be done, uh, that will be done at the end of this year. Instagram is still going so you guys again like I said people who are joining in if you guys want to ask questions you guys are welcome to jump into my twitch stream uh, under Peter on style there if you guys want to ask and interact uh, I'm not answering questions at the moment on the actual live stream on Instagram because I'm just looking at one screen at the moment <clears throat> uh, do I teach during the summer so this session coming up will be starting in May third week of May and we finished sometime I believe uh, early July after that there potentially may be another session um, but it all depends on a trip if I do go on a trip which is supposed to be in September I may delay the session of the class until fall uh, which won't start until like November so this next session is coming up and registration actually is today uh, today's which is 10.44 p.m. my time right now, which is gonna be at midnight, turning into Saturday. Um, oops, my video got paused on Instagram. But yeah, next session I hope will be, you know, like I said, going on in terms of after July, but it all depends on the trip. If I do go on a trip, it'll be delayed. If not, it will happen around that time. So August.
I don't know why Instagram delayed here for a second. Hopefully my connection's okay. Sometimes my internet drops out a little bit. I'm gonna do maybe like one or two more fish down below here, and then we'll start to watercolor these. Uh, the sit-in position of the seat for the class is 150 US. The full version of the class is 750. And that's for eight week live sessions. Each class ranges from three to five hours. <clears throat> and each class seats limited to uh, 15 heads. And with that, each and every person gets feedback with their homework. Um, the live sessions are recorded. They're put up on my YouTube channel and then shared so people can watch the recording again later on. And they're up there for a year for people to have access to. Sit in positions, the difference is that you can sit in and watch and interact and ask questions and draw, but you will not be getting the feedback. That's the only difference. And the sit and seat is great for people who can't financially support the cost of the class. Um, that's one of the reasons why I brought it up, but also because it helps people who have taken the class in the past or for beginners to engage and get a sense of how the class is like, but also to stay in that environment of drawing. Uh, because drawing on your own, especially after doing a class like that, it's really hard to continue on, even though you might do it for a little bit, but then you fall off. I don't know why this Instagram is not connecting. Let me see if I can start it over. Sorry. Instagram kind of failed on me here a second. Live session 36 today, I think. Seems like Instagram crashed on me. Uh, where can you find the class? You can find it on a, sorry, link sometimes can't be, well, can't be posted on here. Uh, I have to change the mods. I apologize, it's my fault. But uh, if you go to Shopify store, you just look up my name, user handle, Peter Hunt Style. If you just even Google it, Peter Hunt Style Shopify, uh, the storefront will come up. And um, registration will be happening in about an hour. So I have to close this up in about 45 minutes so I can uh, go and open up the class registration. <laughs> oh, come on. First time Instagram not worked well. Let's just download it. I'm going to restart Instagram. Okay. Uh, going back to the question, uh, what would you say is the most fun tool or combination of tools for you to create work with? Really like the content, appreciate the generous, appreciate that, Captain Patchy. But in terms of most fun combination of tools, for me, primarily, is just ink and watercolor. That's just me, though. But I like all drawing tools. Ballpoint is something I use, you know, very heavily uh, when I was a student. Um, pencil I still really like drawing with. But when I choose those mediums, it's because my intention is from the very beginning to use those because of the advantages I get from them. But normally, uh, I stick with just straight ink. Um, either felt tip pinks or things like uh, fountain pens I tend to use a lot <clears throat> alright just two more fish down here and we're good to go for the watercolor let's see let's try one yeah high eye stock over there. Let's put one to the back side. Kind of like a parrotfish to a degree. 
with the big beaks. And then one more, I'm going to jump into this. Let me grab my watercolors first, too. What type of brushes uh, do I recommend in terms of watercolor or for inking? ink well uh, there are several different types you can use like right now I'm using the Pigma FB Sakura this is also considered a brush pen but more felt tip uh, it's not an actual sable brush it's got like a spongier kind of a felt material uh, there are actual brushes you can use you know the pocket brush pens from um, Kuretake there's also the Pentel color brush pens which I favor the most also you can just use brush and ink right let's see this didn't start up. What is going on Instagram? But yeah, those kind of brush pens are probably the ones I would use the most. Pento color brush pen is my favorite. Who are some well-known artists that you, can you rephrase that question that I went to Art Center with? Is that what the question was? Uh, favorite paper to use with the Pigma FB pen? To be honest, with this pen, any paper is actually really good. This is, you know, even like copy paper, honestly. In this situation of the kind of pen I'm using, the paper doesn't really matter if you're only going to stick with the ink. If you're planning to go, let's say, like wet mediums of like marker or watercolor, then the paper matters, right? So I would be using like cold pressed paper watercolor. But in just in terms of using this pen, any paper is fine. Um, Bucket Planks is asking voice struggle with pen and ink shading. People said I should follow the form, but I've seen many examples where they have not followed the form. So the shading form is not important, but the shadow following the form. Um, so it's, it's one of those situations where it's more based on the individual sketch and the decision of what you want to do with it. It's about consistency, if anything else. I mean, you can literally shade, you know, a shadow side with one directional hatching. That doesn't follow the form. It ends up making it more graphical and two-dimensional but at least you've chosen to do so. If you go with the form, it makes it feel more volumetric, right? Because you're making it feel more ballooned out. But another thing is that you can follow the surface of texture or grain, like hair or skin or even scales. So the hatching can follow in potentially multiple directions. But the idea is first establishing grouping of values. Where's your light? Where's your shadow? Then how do you want to treat the surface? Then choosing a consistent direction of hatching sticking with it but there's really no right and wrong what it comes down to is again your aesthetic and based on experimentation based on multiple different iterations over time you just have to follow and find what you find to be the most interesting visually for you of course I would also then look at different artists as inspiration in terms of people that you look up to or you find their aesthetic to be very attractive and you also then try to do master copies you try to mimic the visual look that the art that artist is doing so as you do so, you start to kind of harness a little bit as to like how that artist completed or made decisions to get to that point. So educationally, combination of all those things. Did you attend Art Center with any other well-known artists? Well, I mean, it depends on what you mean by well-known. If it's within our industry, yeah, for sure. For the general audience, would they know these people? Most likely not, right? 
So for us in a group of this live stream right now, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming a majority of you may have heard some of the artists before. Uh, I mean, in my graduating class at Art Center, one of them was uh, my friend James, James Petty. James is, is one of the co-founders of Brainstorm School, but he's worked on numerous projects, you know. Uh, he recently just did one for the Netflix special that love, I think, something robots, right? The animated thing. He has a short on there. Um, but in, in terms of if you're asking like famous people, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> They're just friends to me. So uh, I guess another one would be like my friend Ryan, right? Ryan Minerding, who's from the same art center time as me. I mean, he was in my dy dynamic sketching class when I was a TA for it, Teacher's A. Uh, Ryan right now is the head of Marvel Cinematics in terms of visual development. You know, uh, he was art center, and you know I've known him since he was just a student coming in. He's probably one of the more, I guess, well known because Marvel being so big right now, in terms of movies and shows and that kind of stuff, and he runs such a big department. Him and you know, I mean, all the guys there I generally know, uh, guys like Andy Park and. You know, even the groups that work within the team itself, they're all art center people. Uh, I'm new to, uh, it's a question from RCP Robot is, uh, I'm new to art, but I know I want to mainly focus on digital. Do you think there is any issue with exclusively practicing on and drawing on pen display tablets? Uh, yes and no. Um, I think it can be great starting with digital tablets because you know you're you're going straight to the source of the material that is industry standard, right? So why wouldn't you just go to digital? Because how how many concept artists out there right now that work in animation or not animation but like f live action film or games work on paper and pen? Very few. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but the majority work on digital. I myself. You know, if I get freelance jobs and contract jobs working, let's say, client work, I'm mostly going to go digital, right? So as someone who's starting, would it be bad then to work on something digital to begin with? Uh, again, no, because the early introduction can be a good thing. But I think it's important to have balance, right? So what is the other aspect to it? What is the flip side? Well, yes as well in terms of uh, not wanting to go that direction, mainly because... Um, well, it should, it should be more no, but um, mainly because when you start with digital tools, you also build very bad habits. Those bad habits can be, I've seen many people complain about control Z, right? They want to undo something. What happens is that you, you, you don't really build a confidence, commitment to your skill sets, drawing, painting, visualizing, conceptualizing, that kind of stuff, right? So you want to redo the thing over and over again. You spend hours just to, cut, just to come up with a sketch, just to come up with an idea, where you should be able to spend you know, that time generating as many possible iterations as you can. So by starting off digitally, you're given those strengths that digital does have so early that you're unable to let go of those things. You become highly dependent on them. You don't want to become dependent. You want to be able to use them as a strength, but you don't want to be you know, connected to them to a point where you gotta always find a way out using that as a tool set. Um, you should be able to problem solve visually as you draw. Control Z is still a great tool, but that shouldn't be the main thing. Not only that, you know, there's always this fear that is generated. So what do people do? I've seen paintings that have gigs and gigs worth of layers. Hundreds of layers for a painting. They do a paint stroke, new layer. Paint stroke, new layer. It's ridiculous. In my paintings digitally, I normally have 10 layers or less, right? But some people are so, but I need to control every single aspect of it. The, it's the illusion of control. It's the fear of letting go. So they, they commit or they move in that direction when it comes to digital drawing and it doesn't strengthen their confidence in new ways. If anything, it actually lengthens your process, you know? Uh, so I think, again, like I said, there are pros and cons. It doesn't mean you should stay away from digital. I'm saying harness it and balance it while you also build other skill sets. All right. I still haven't gone live yet. Something's going on with, with Instagram. I don't know what it is. Let me actually um, disconnect from my Wi-Fi. Reconnect again. A uh, couple questions from earlier. 
in terms of fish in different positions i would love to but in this situation my mindset is that the person fishing right now is pulling them out of the water and laying them flat side view so if he was in the water looking at them in observation then i would draw a fish in different positions i would but in this particular page i wanted to be laid out similar to my earlier page that i had uh, one of the earlier pages was the kind of like the bugs and insects this one here so these are all just top views I'm making them feel like it's you know more like a study and so they're being pinned into the page so I want these fish to also be laid out all similarly but I definitely will do a page later on where he's like in the water like diving around and you'll see like underwater scenes and fish swimming around that kind of stuff Yeah, I've always had you know relative success with Instagram connecting, but for today, for some reason, it's not working so well. Anyways, <clears throat> a couple of the questions from above. Uh, nothing rhymes is asking, for the sitting classes, will students have access to lecture recordings? Yes, for the same extended period of time, absolutely. Uh, I learn kind of slowly, and a lot of times I need to spend two or three weeks on lectures, so yes, you have the same uh, level of access to the content. The only thing you just don't get is feedback. Let's see something else here in terms of questions. Do you do any sumi inking? I have in the past, a lot. And what kind of practice would you recommend for that? Uh, it's very similar to like how my drawing classes are set up. It's a lot of muscle memory movements, strokes, lines, rotations, you know, playing with the brushes, what kind of brushes you want to use, thick and thin, you know, that kind of stuff. But the actual time emphasis put into the materials so you know gather like not not like waste away paper you want to get some good stuff too but you want to become very familiar with the tool set with that one a lot of it is is very much on patience for sure assuming ink and brushes because it's so much about muscle memory control do you think that putting more detail in environments in the environment the subject is in makes us oh okay uh, detail in the environment the subject is in makes the subject seem much more three-dimensional um, not necessarily because more detail can also make it much more flat because it equalizes everything if anything less detail to the background is the way we see the world around us right so we have things like atmospheric perspective depth gases in the air you know that kind of stuff kind of like make things more silhouette so more detail can be in the foreground less detail to the background so that can create this sense of space. So uh, do I currently teach anywhere online other than my mentorship class in CGMA? Yeah, so that's what we're talking about today, Broken Robot Art, is that we're doing, I'm, I've been doing online classes on my own. Uh, so registration actually is happening tonight at midnight Pacific time, as it turns to Saturday. So that's gonna be in about an hour. So we're gonna be drawing for maybe about 45 more minutes, and then I'm gonna break off here. Let's just do one last fish here. Let's see, let's go for, I love the angler type fish. Maybe some, I mean, they're all kind of grotesque, so uh, maybe something a bit more big eyed, kind of like the one beforehand. Kind of blunted mouth structure. box here back in kind of more of a flowy fin looking for just a movement of shapes couple questions from above again uh, let's see drawing with ink without an underdrawing help your confidence so much yeah so the commitment in building confidence absolutely uh, do you get inspiration from video games I play some Monica now and it has amazing sea creature designs absolutely I mean how is it any different than like looking at art books or even the world around us like stepping outside going to a museum going to the zoo going to the gardens those things that you see in the real world 
are also the inspirations for the people that created Subnautica, right? So looking at the real world is just as important as looking at the made-up world. But there's nothing wrong with looking at that stuff in the imaginary world, whether it's a game or a film or animation or a comic, because it's that individual artist's process to come up with that and be able to re-engineer it backwards a little bit to see how it came about can help you understand how to develop your own, potentially. So uh, very much, it can be very helpful. Do you happen to have any advice or have advice for people that are learning perspective? Some aspects of it can come across as something complicated. It's very complicated. It's like math for a lot of people. I didn't like it at first either. Uh, I still, to, you know, to a degree, still fight with it. But um, the one thing you have to understand is that it is absolutely necessary. So as much as you may find it complicating, you want to know as much of the perspective basics as you can. Will you use every element of perspective as an actual technique? More than likely not, right? Like in any skill set, will you use every single skill that you learn from? No, you tend to kind of side to the strengths of what you use most, right? So in perspective, I know enough to use, but do I use every single thing that I learned from the past? Do I remember them? I don't. Um, I need to know just enough to get the job done. That's the first thing, right? Uh, the other part, of course, is looking for the actual application. So learning the technique is one thing, but if you can't see the actual use of it, it doesn't drive the sense of enthusiasm or energy and, and also excitement. Because to you, it seems like just busy work. But if you can actually see how to use the outcome, like that's what can be done with that particular technique, then I want to do more of it, right, potentially. Or even imitate that first to kind of find out a way to bring them together. So look for ways of seeing how the long-term effects are, essentially. Question is, can you or did you draw in Kim Jong-gi style? The question I have is, do you, can you actually verbalize what Kim Jong-gi style is, right? Uh, that word of style can be a little bit hard to convey and also understand for many people. Um, the importance of style when it comes up is it even truly necessary and is what we're seeing from certain artists in actual style in the first place this is something I'm asking for people you know you, you guys can think of it if you want to but um, if I was to have that question presented to me then right what is the style of Kim Jong-gi not can I draw in a style uh, Okay, so then the technique, right? The technique of how he does his drawings, using certain tool sets, the ink, the smearing of it, that kind of stuff. Would I be able to do that? I mean, sure. Do I draw in his thematics, his themes? Not necessarily, right? I don't draw the kind of stuff that he draws. Um, do I use similar techniques, right? Sure, absolutely. But is he also much more proficient, you know, and a prodigy in the things that he does. Absolutely. I can't draw like Kim Jong-gi. I'm not as good as him. Uh, but am I as confident and as enthusiastic in terms of what I can do? For sure. And I look up to people like him and, and many other artists that are out there who I think can draw amazingly well. And everybody has their own strengths, right? You can't call Kim Jong-gi the best draftsman right now completely. I mean, some people will. But I say he's very good in terms of what his practice is but there are many other artists that can draw amazingly well in terms of my opinion at the same level of proficiency but has potentially different themes or different you know techniques uh, for instance like within the superani team i really love eliza's work eliza avanova's work but she has nothing in relation to what kim jong-hee does but i think she's just as good in terms of being a draftsman so is carl carl kapinski but he doesn't necessarily always draw the same kind of things that Eliza does or is what Kim Jong-gi does. Now, will we consider those styles? Not necessarily. I would consider them more of like visual information of things they've soaked up and how they processed it. Style is dictated by, you know, potentially uh, a project, uh, potentially a, you know, a problem that needs to have a visual look. So style then has to be consistent within the world that they're, that they're building. So let's say I'm building an animation, right? Putting together one, feature film, animation. Well, that animation has to have a visual style, 
right? That style guide is developed early on. Shape language, proportions, color tones, uh, line, you know, all the kind of things, gesture, movements, that's all part of a style, that's a part of the world that has to be consistent throughout the entire thing. All artists working on it have to be able to match up to that style. Now, could one artist having a style influence a project? Absolutely, of course. And could Kim Jong-gi have a certain aesthetic and style that can influence a project? For sure. Um, but, you know, coming back to the question, would I draw in Kim jong Gi's style? Not necessarily. I don't draw in his themes. I don't think I draw in his style. Uh, do I use a lot of similar kind of like techniques of thinking? For sure, because they're techniques. Everybody uses the same kind of techniques, right? Um, perspective, figure drawing, form language, dynamic sketching, you know, that kind of stuff. And by recombining them in certain ways, by putting twists on things and how we perceive the world, we can then generate a visual look that might then side to that individual artist a little bit. Uh, but to create that voice and to create that aesthetic or style has to come through taste of constant practice and comparison. Um, but like I said, it's also based on then generating work for certain projects, even your own independent projects, and coming up with a visual style for that project that fits best. So then the question is, if you're younger, should I be worried about having a style? Is a question I get all the time. No, because whoever's going to hire you is not hiring you for your style, right, in a commercial art form. Unless you're so good, or they have a, a, such a unique style set that maybe you know, a client wants to have from you, that would influence that project. Which can happen, but it's a very small case of percentage, right? But in most situations, you're looking for young people to be able to work on a project production, but you got to match up to that project style that's been developed by the leads that are there at the company. So your work has to show skill sets that are adaptable, if anything else. You understand the basics. You understand adaptation, you understand process, problem solving, and also a lot of the fundamentals that we just talked about, right? Sorry, that ballooned into some, something else. <laughs> Apologies. Um, I think we're finished here with the fish. I'm going to go into the watercolor a little bit right now. I'm going to come back and darken up a few things. But let me just bring up the watercolor and just kind of throw some flashes of color on this stuff here right now. Put this over here to the side. Let's see. <clears throat> a couple of good questions from above. What do you think are the differences between taking classes online or yeah, online versus in person? Well, I think there are quite a big difference between them. Do I think both experiences are positive? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think you know having the opportunity to have access to information but also people online or physically as a school, I think are both great. And both have pros and cons, right? The pro to the online class is that people from all over the world can take them. You don't have to travel to a location to take the class. So it has a huge benefit there. You can be, you can be in your home and take the online class. The downside is, of course, compared to the physical version, is that you don't have the actual hands-on, uh, kind of like in-person, uh, information or I guess examples too right uh, some of the things we're working on but also you don't really get the actual connection from the people in the class you might think well how's that any different than being in a class online I'm connected there I can talk to these people well you talk to them then but then when the class is done do you ever talk to those students again maybe you will a few of them but it's a very small percentage and it takes a lot of effort to maintain that connection it really does and once you take that class once and move on to something else you may not ever see those people again they might not take the same classes. The benefit of going to places like Art Center or local schools that were here in LA is that as I took classes, you know, with the friends that I had, we would all talk, hey, what are you gonna take next? We might even like move together. So then I'm with my friends and with my community of people, of artists, for class after class after class for years potentially. And we formulate this network and we build off of each other. We learn off of each other. Just as much we learn from the classes, we learn from each other as, as just as much so. So there's a huge benefit to that, which is creating, like I said, this strong network of people that you can build to know. And I think that is priceless, right? And schools like Art Center and other schools are extremely expensive, risk, very risky. 
However, the, the positive is from that part of community. People today right now are telling people, uh, young students, don't go to college, don't go to art center. It's not worth it. It's a waste of money. I'm never on that side. I'm not going to say art center is the best place to, go, place to go either, by the way. I'm not saying going to college is the best, thing option, best option either. I'm saying it's an opportunity that is a chance to discover or even experience something, even for a little bit, to make your own decision, right? Don't listen to these other professional artists telling you what you should be doing. Go find that yourself. You might think, but it's so expensive. Nobody said you had to finish. I'm not saying you have to go there to actually take a full-time degree and, and actually finish for your programs. You go to Art Center, just try it one term. Try it, at the very least. Formulate your own opinion, right? I know it's a risk still. It's still expensive just to take one term. But at least now you know. That environment was not for me. The people I didn't really click with. That structure wasn't mine. You'll find something else. But now, again, you know. But if people are telling you left and right, it's like, oh, don't go to this school, don't go to that school. I had a bad experience. Well, that's their experience, not, not yours. It's good to hear advice. It's good to be mindful of them. It's great for comparison, but it still shouldn't overly influence your decisions. It's just something to have as a comparison. But to compare, you have to experience it. That then leads into the question from uh, Balthazar Chris is, does one have to go to art center or art school in general to put our foot in the door to get in the entertainment industry. No, absolutely not. But does it help? It can, due to the reason what I just said to you, networking. If you go to these online classes, the networking is much more difficult. Because again, like I said, the people you come into the class with online, you don't really get to know them, right? And if you did, like I said, it takes a large amount of energy to maintain that connection. Most people are very afraid to come out of their shell. And, you know, when you're at an online class, at the end of the day, when you turn off the computer, you're still in your room, you know, just behind the computer. When you're done with classes physically, the class is done. Hey, let's hang out more. Let's go to this place and get something to drink or get something to eat. Of course, right now it's still difficult because everything is a shutdown. But when things were live, that is what could happen. You build the social aspects of things. Learning techniques is just one part of it in the industry. You need other things in the industry experience. How to socialize, how to talk, how to actually have confidence in the, in the things you're trying to actually pursue. Those are all just as important in the industry as the technique themselves. Let's see. Young Ching Art is asking, <clears throat> I recently noticed that when I'm trying to study a subject, my head tends to go empty. Even when I try to, uh, try to deliberate practice, it feels like I'm not getting much info into my brain. Is that normal or is that something wrong with me? I would say that's relatively normal, um, especially if you're just beginning, right? Starting to start a subject. Uh, you know, your head tends to kind of, kind of go into autopilot. It kind of going to go into blank a little bit. It's because you're, you're thinking so hard in the moment about actually doing the work that it's not necess it doesn't feel like it's going in. But that's also an illusion is that through the practice of it, not a single time, but 10, 20, 100 times over, in that single moment of you doing it, it doesn't really feel like you're retaining the information. But in time, it's starting to seep in. You just don't see the immediate effect just yet, right? It takes time to actually show the application. But you have to be patient enough to stick with it long enough to see the, the rewards come through. If you're looking for a fast turnaround, you're in the wrong business. Patience. It's, it's going to work. If you're still, uh, you know, dubious in terms of your working ethics and you know, all that kind of stuff and uh, drive and hunger, g given enough time, it will work out. Let's see, Lag JPEG is asking, you know, what would I recommend to an art center student struggling with time management and comparing yourself to others? Comparing yourself to others is important. But the mindset has to change. If you're, if you're comparing yourself to others thinking, why am I not as good and feeling down about it, you gotta change that thought. If you're saying, why am I not as good and how am I gonna get better and you're driven to look for it, right? Not because you feel like you're worse or because you like, feel like you're not good enough, but because you're looking for the possibilities of what people can do. If anything, what happens over time 
is that you actually want to find more people that are continually stronger than you, always better than you. Because that drives you to look for the lead in that pack by saying that person has gone that direction that far. That's possible. So then if I drive hard enough, would I be able to get there too? The quite, for me, again, I look at these kind of people that I surround myself with now. Guys like Kim Jong-gi, guys like Carl Kapinski. I'm in that pool of water right now, right? And they are far better than me. I can honestly say that. But I'm not saying that in a way to bring myself down. I'm saying that that's literally truth. These people have worked that much more and they're in that position. They're really that good. That's possible. That means if I work hard enough, would I be just as good if not better than them? I will try. Will it happen? Doesn't matter. Most likely not, but I don't care. I'm still going to try as hard as I can to see what can happen in that time that I'm given, right? If it doesn't work out, no regret because I tried as hard as I could. But let's say, oh, I'm not as good as guys like Kim Jong-gi. I'm not as good as guys like Caro or Nicholas Namiri or whoever else. I'm not going to sit there kicking myself, right? There's no regret at that point. So the battle then, of course, is always against yourself. But you need the competition because you got to see where you're situated. Where do you stand among all these other peers? And that should, if anything else, invigorate you, not scare you. Every time I'm around those guys from Superani, I get to hang out with them, you know, and go to shows or do gallery work. I look around, sit next to them, and be like, man, they're so good. But then I start to like get built up, right? The energy, the fire starts to build even stronger. It's like, man, I gotta draw even more, <laughs> you know? And the thing about this is I guarantee you they're thinking the same thing. That's the way this industry works. In terms of time management, uh, I think a lot of it is very much dictated by the individual, of course, right? Some people are very good at doing it by themselves. I think others need other people. You need help by a community. By working with others, you have to build a routine. And when someone's expecting you to come out and start working on things, you feel driven to go out and actually complete that work, right? But when you're kind of sitting by yourself in a room, it's really hard to keep up that management. You know, it's good to have other hobbies, but don't let them become uh, dependencies or distractions. You can do those things, play games, watch movies, do those things for sure. But don't just turn to them because you feel like I can't work right now because you know I don't have the energy or I don't have the interest. You do them because you feel like you can actually gain something from them. I mean, I understand. It can be fine to also take a, a break and relax and I don't really have the energy, I'm tired and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, have those moments also. But if you're sitting there for nine hours, not doing anything, <laughs> it's like, oh, but I need more rest time. There's a problem there, right? If anything else, then of course structure. Uh, maybe there is something like a calendar structure to stick with. From there, it's the constant activity of doing it. It takes time. I would say about a good two weeks to really get into the routine. It's much like exercise, right? Any kind of physical exercise in the beginning, the first three, four days sucks. After a week, it feels sore, getting a bit better. Two, three weeks in a month, you start to build a routine, right? It's got to become normalized. A uh, question is, I heard that I gave a mini watercolor lesson in the last time I was sketching uh, class, the extension version. Am I planning to do it again? I am. I will, Gwench. Let's see. Hey, Kevin, if you're still there, absolutely, man. Please do. Cam Kamish is asking, asking, as a begin, I'm a beginner, and I put too much details in my drawing, and I think it's not right. What should I do? Uh, don't detail. Stick to the simplicity, the shapes only. Build up to your details. Do several drawings. If you're drawing a person, draw one person as basic and simple as you can. Draw it again. Repeat the process. Clean things up. Make it more accurate. Add more details slowly as you go. Instead of detailing something small, blow it up bigger. Do a head study. Detail that. Draw a bunch of bodies, it's just a study form proportion. Okay, let's go move on to other fish here. Anyways, I hope the questions here uh, that I've tried to give advice to have been helpful. I hope you guys have found them interesting, uh, thought provoking, and in no way am I telling what people should do, and in no way I'm telling you what is right or wrong. 
Uh, this is just based on my opinion, based on just what my thoughts are from observations of other people in my own life, uh, and take it for what it is, you know. But it's nice to have people here hanging out, and I hope that you guys are also potentially working, drawing, doing something creative, uh, as I'm also doing myself. The idea within these streams is always nice to take a time and chance to come together, um, and instead of just watching, sitting there, that you should also be joining in. And as you do, you guys can, you know, talk with each other and uh, whatnot. Build the energy to keep building more and doing more. A lot of fish have the counter contrasting or the counter uh, counter shading, dark on top, light on bottom. So you use saturation to go on top of the body, white belly underneath. You once mentioned being very influenced by Katsuya Terada. Can you tell us about what you liked about his work and how it influenced your own? Well, for me, I really loved his line, his actual line. From the way he hatched, from the way he accented details, uh, it felt so effortless. And it was organized in a way where just the aesthetic of it, I recognized, you know? The organization of lines, how they're put down. And I started to understand more about the way he thought when I met him, you know, so after meeting him a couple times Watching him draw live. I would ask him questions also And some of the questions I asked were things like, you know, much like what you guys are asking Like what are you thinking right there as you're drawing? Right? What's the process that goes into it? That was one of the questions I asked him and his answer was kind of revealing because it kind of was similar to the way I thought in drawing as well, too His reply was that for him, when he draws, the question was kind of like, you know, how do you predict the line as you then go from one line to another one, right? How do you, how are you able to visualize the directions of line work, essentially? And for him, his answer was, each line, it makes sense for him to be there where it needs to be. Because for him, drawing was like writing. Think of it where a line is like a letter. And as you combine letters together, you formulate words. The word, you know, has a certain script. So the, the drawing has certain combinations of line work to express a visual. As you put the words together, you can formulate sentences, from sentences to essays or, or poems. So a visual drawing or a combination of line strokes, it makes sense to put them there because they go together, right? To express something visual as a communication. So the idea is that you're trying to hone your skills to write properly through drawing so that it makes sense, the clarity of read, visual communication. Paint one of them orange with zebra lines. Yeah, I'll do that. Laker colors, <laughs> maybe purple and yellow. Yeah, we can do that too. Creating a cardboard army helmet with short film. That's awesome. So Sashi. What kind of army helmet is that? I'm wondering. Is it like World War II or historical, cultural? It's nice hearing about projects that people are working on. Okay, let's move on to another fish. Let's go with that yellowish orange one with zebra stripes. Wet on wet. Let's choose this guy over here. Again, a lot of water uh, for the first application to spread the uh, pigment out. It's much more saturated on the on the um, palette. As it gets into the paper, as I spread it out, it becomes less saturated. Uh, the transparency starts to come through, and I build up to saturations. I 
I'm going to be using some cast shadows to help separate them a little bit. Almost as easy to lay them flat onto like a table or something like this. World War II, awesome. Uh, what watercolor am I using? Uh, this is a water brush made by Pentel. And then the watercolor is the Schmink watercolor. Uh, this is, I believe, a German or Austrian brand. This should be readily available at some local art stores, Schmink brand. It's not cheap, but it's a pretty good watercolor. Still a little bit of kind of a peach or pinkish color to the belly. Screen-wise, it's not going to be the same as my actual paper, by the way. Um, there's always a loss of quality or clarity as it goes from video, from the paper. I always get that comment when some people actually look at my actual sketchbooks, and it's like, man, this is so different compared to what I saw my, uh, on social media. It's like, yeah, it's usually the, digital or digi the digitization of the photograph kills the quality of the image quite a bit. So more than likely what you're seeing at the moment, it's probably not as nice. So I do apologize. Let's go into the stripes. Let's put a little bit of a cool a blue in there. Eleven thirty at the moment, so I want to go maybe fifteen minutes more because I got to open up registration for classes here real soon. If anybody has any last couple of questions, comments, we still have a little bit of time. You guys are still welcome to ask. Um, next time I'll be streaming. I'm hoping sometime next week. I'm gonna try to get back on that regular schedule. Uh, I was supposed to be on earlier last this week, but um, schedule-wise didn't really work out. But after today, next week I'm hoping maybe on. Um, Monday, possibly. <clears throat> Let's see, the question for Tony Gear is the materials for the classes will be the same as the standard dynamic sketching class? Yes. And I will send out a welcome email for everybody who signs up. I injured my dominant uh, art hand, I'm assuming, and I've lost patience waiting for it to heal. Ugh. Uh, I have been practicing with my other arm and was wondering if you had any tips for drawing with a non-dominant hand. Well, um, it's going to be a pain in the ass trying to get that to a level of control that you expect it to. Uh, I draw with my non-dominant hand as much as I can. I did one today, this one right here, a lefty drawing. Um, but uh, it took me quite a bit of time even just to get somewhat comfortable managing the tool you know with the result of the actual image uh, for me I would say months right but in that situation it's time really if anything else there's no way of, there's no shortcut even like that's the healing aspect to it I mean there's no shortcut you can't heal faster you can't force it to and honestly the patience to let it heal correctly is probably far more important right uh, than trying to like force yourself to draw more like I would try to find different ways of expressing your creativity or storytelling different mediums different ways of looking at things it could be like photography it could be um, I don't know 3d modeling through computer maybe you can't use your hand that well from that part either but again like photography is one thing maybe there could be some other things out there maybe more writing I don't know if if you're saying if you're saying that I can't actually control the tool at all you know then I understand you're kind of stuck a little bit um, it could be through getting outside more. I don't know. It could be a little bit of travel if you have to. Um, but something to kind of put you in a position where you're always finding visual inspiration and also some form of creativity. It doesn't always have to come down to you drawing, right? And I understand that sounds like it's kind of going backwards. Like you should be building your, your basically your mileage when it comes to drawing. But I talked about this a lot earlier, which is the idea that learning doesn't only just come from uh, the physical activity of sitting there and drawing and sketching, right? Building as an artist is the experience in life. So don't rush through it and don't cut yourself off from 
learning in different ways. What that is, I mean, you have to discover that, but I would hope you find it. Then, of course, I hope you heal well, you know, so. Let me zoom in a little bit here, the camera. There we go. Uh, what do you think is the best way to get out of the blank mind when trying to create something imaginative or studying from pictures? Blank mind in terms of like not being thoughtful? I'm not quite sure in terms of your specific question, if you want to rephrase that sharp edge in terms of specific details about your question here. Uh, what do you mean by blank mind? Like you're going to autopilot, uh, you're not having intention of thoughts, or you're getting lost. What do you mean by that? How to best discover your mistakes so I can improve? I think a lot of times it's hard to see your mistakes and I don't know who I should ask. Yeah, I understand. You, sometimes you can't see them at all. And you do need a new pair of eyes sometimes. Uh, or at least, you know, a different set of eyes to always see something that you don't always catch. And, and that could be, honestly, anybody. Yeah, it will be recommended. It will be like students and instructors, of course. But if you're not actually in a class, then what do you go to? I mean, you can use social media. But, you know, maybe it's not the most confident place to go to. And maybe you don't really get as much response as you want. Um, sometimes it can be just a person next to you, honestly like family, um, someone you know, friends, but you're like, well, they're not artists. They don't necessarily have to be artists to look for something that stands out, right? For instance, if you're drawing something from reference, and you're looking for irregularities, something that's off a little bit. You might even ask them, hey, how close does this look to the image in the photograph I'm drawing from, right? Does something seem off to you? They might not even be able to tell you exactly, but if they can see something that feels slightly inaccurate, because we can all judge accuracy by comparison all people right but like I said it may not be exactly what you're looking for um, so in that situation definitely looking for a community I'm sure you can find some sort of grouping of discord you're on Facebook possibly as well too or Instagram people that are just coming together and sharing work if you can't find it I mean like I said taking classes is gonna be one of your best first steps Of course, I know that not all people can afford that, but still, maybe you can save up to it, you know. Might not happen today, may not happen tomorrow, but maybe sometime later in the year, maybe sometime next year. Uh, do I have a sit-in for my intro design class? Right now, I'm kind of not opening it up for that. For the dynamic sketching class, I am, but for the intro design thinking class, I'm only opening it for the full layer enroll. Um, I made that decision at this point because uh, it's it's one of those classes that doesn't fill up to a large degree. So if it was only like sit-in people, it'd be kind of awkward, you know. So uh, I only want it to be just people that are enrolled at the moment because I only literally get like five, six people in the class sometimes, which is good. I like that. You know, I want it to be a small class. But if I leave the the opportunity for only sit-ins, then people might only do the sit-in which wouldn't really work. Let's see, what else we have here? Do I still teach at Art Center? If so, what class are you currently teaching? I am not teaching at Art Center right now. Uh, I, the last term I taught at Art Center was last year, 2020, in March, the spring term. Uh, spring term was began in January, we went into quarantine in March. As we went into quarantine, we went to an online course. And I finished the term online with, with Art Center. Summer term, I usually am off, no matter what. Fall term, I didn't hear back from them. And I never reached out. <laughs> uh, and the reason why is because, you know, at the beginning of 2020, I had started my own classes. So all of my energy and emphasis is already focusing on my classes. I had no interest, you know, in reaching out to Art Center. If they wanted me, I had considered it but I didn't hear from them. So I essentially just took it as moving on. Uh, I had a lot of criticisms to Art Center as well too and how they dealt with the quarantine and how they dealt with students. Uh, I was not very favorable to what they were trying to do, um, especially in terms of their online experience. I just didn't think it, was, uh, it wasn't handled very well. 
even with the way they handle the, their international students, I also thought that was treated very poorly. So um, I didn't want to have that much affiliation with the school there afterwards either. And because my own online classes were doing so well, I had no concern of going back to Art Center. I've been doing it for 10 years. 10 years of Art Center I gave my life to. So not going back, I felt like I've kind of like dusted my hands and you know, I did what I needed to do on my part. I, I carried on the legacy of my mentor and did 10 years of it and I don't need to do it at Art Center anymore. I can take it out, which I've already done, I've taken it out of Art Center and I don't need to be there at this point. If they asked me back, I'd consider it still, but it's not a huge calling for me anymore. You know, for me now, it's about taking control of the platform, my own thing, people recognizing for, you know, the stuff that I'm pushing towards still, still recognizing, you know, the history of the class and for Norm as well. Um, Norm being my mentor who taught the class originally. But yeah, that's one of the uh, reasons why I'm not back at Art Center. I mean, there's a lot more to it, but I don't need to get into it. If, I mean, just people need to hear it. It's boring stuff. So I was reading one of the comments here. I was trying to see if there was a question or not. Nomen was disappointing as Broken Robot Art was saying. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know much about how Nomen uh, transferred online. I know the director of Nomen, um, good friends with them. You know, they're, they're a good school in terms of what they do, in terms of what their focus is, but I don't know exactly how it went for them in terms of 2020, but it feels rough and that's unfortunate. I don't think many art schools did well in terms of transitioning as an art online school. It's difficult to do as an art school because a lot of the things that they did, you know, demand so much of it being on location, you know, being physically there. And when you kind of lose that, most of the instructors are not really properly set up to teach online. Um, I mean, I'll tell you as one of the things in terms of my thoughts, that was one of the problems I had was that at Art Center when when we went into online classes in March, they literally took a week off of the term of Art Center, and they used that week to bring the instructors up into, you know, the same level or at least you know having them understand how to run an online class essentially. So they got you know Art Center and everybody a Zoom account, and they had these like live meeting or online meetings trying to train them. I'm like, how it's supposed to be run in a week. I, I, what they should have done was closed Art Center, refunded the students that they actually was there for whatever number of weeks for the term, right? Trained the instructors for the entirety of the rest of the term, and then brought them back for summer online. But they didn't. They just kept going, saying, oh, we're taking the week off. We're training the instructors, which none of them had no idea what to do. Because I went to you know the actual live meetings. Um, you know, Most of the instructors at Art Center are old. They're like 60, 70 years old, some of them. Now, I'm not saying they're bad instructors. They're amazing instructors. The problem is they've never taught online. And teaching online is actually a different beast compared to teaching in a physical class. I'm not saying it's harder. I'm saying it's different. Uh, because if you have no experience of it, it just makes it a poor learning environment. And a lot of the students suffer that term because of it. So there goes $20,000 down the drain for them, right? Which is ridiculous. So when I was in that live meeting, listening to these instructors, not knowing what they're doing, to me, I'm just like, oh my God, you know, this is going to be horrible. Um, I've been teaching online for 10 years, so I already knew generally what to do, and my setup was already there. For them, they had no cameras, they had, they're all going off their phones, you know, they don't have their tables, they have no lighting situation. Some of them don't have any location to really do it in. So to expect their instructors all of a sudden to adapt in that immediate moment, I thought was ridiculous. And... Um, unfair for the students and for the instructors that was an administration problem I think they should have stopped the term I think most schools should have done this they should have shut it down refund the students but of course money right uh, are they gonna do that most likely not Okay, Sharp Edge, uh, when you have an idea of a certain vision of a character or animal, but 
making applying and translating tra structure and breaking down shapes is harder than when using a photo. Um, yeah, again, the question is still, I mean, I'll try to answer as best I can, sharp edge. Um, you know, the idea of, of a vision of a character, a design of a character, right? And you're trying to apply things like structure and form, you know, breaking down things is harder than, using, when, than you know, compared to using a photograph. And it is. So a part of the, what I teach in the class of dynamic sketching is an aspect of that, which is whatever we're looking at, whether it's a photograph live in person, the ability to just to copy that is only time. If I gave you guys five hours in a photograph of a, of a fish, I said, draw that. Most of you here will most likely be able to do a relatively good job. You might think, oh, I don't know. Even... No, trust me. If I give you enough time and I give you a photograph of a fish, I draw that as close as you can do it. You know, you won't feel lost. You'll know what to do. I look at it and I copy it. But if I said, translate this for me, break it down to something that is something uh, not only interpreted as a form, but also can be used to build a better memory, but then I'll take that image of what you've broken down and turn it in space for me without any reference. And for a lot of you, you're like, I don't know where to begin with that. What shapes do I start with? What am I actually breaking down, right? That is the idea of how to observe. That's what the class is about that I teach. And it is much harder, much more difficult. It's easy for me, for me to say, keep it simple. But the action of doing it is very, very hard. And this is where then taking a class on that and also having someone show you is a big aspect to this. Uh, is there any tips you can give to a high schooler, junior? Uh, yeah, draw. If you like to draw, draw more, right? No matter what anybody says. Uh, don't worry about career. Don't worry about like where you need to go or what you have to prove. Do it because you really love it. Now, I understand that sometimes, you know, parents and stuff like this are wanting to go in a certain direction because, you know, they're worried. They, they want to make sure that you have a viable future. I understand that. Um, but it's also important that you really stick to your guns, but really show that you're completely invested and passionate about it. If you're just tiptoeing around it, more than likely, a parent figure, authoritative figure, sees that you're not really sure. Then they're going to try to push you in a direction. But if you're so committed that you can't break away from it. They might start to see that. But this is someone that actually is in love with this thing, right? This is not just because it's something they do just for fun. It's not a hobby. It's because you see this as more than a job. This is a part of you as an individual, the core being of you. I've been drawing since the age of five. I haven't stopped since then. I think my parents saw that. They knew that that's all I really wanted to do. Now, coming from an Asian family, they could have said, don't do this, right? Don't do art. Study this. But they didn't. They let me explore the world of art because they saw how infatuated I was with it. I couldn't break away from it. I'm assuming that was the case, you know? I could be wrong, but um, I would hope that thought can bleed over to other people. It's hard to make that, I mean, you can't make a choice to be like, I'm committed now, I'm gonna do it. It's through your actions, right? You can't just tell your parents. You gotta show it to them. Uh, when using watercolor, do you recommend setting a limit on how many colors you use for individual paintings? It, think more about the temperature and the values. Don't worry about how many colors or what colors, temperature and value. Warm or cool, right? Lighting situation. Simple as something like that. Start with this initially. Value-wise, you can control that, but the value is the most important thing. Color-wise, you can use whatever color you want to, but the temperature can influence it. I mean, that's the early beginnings of painting, but there's many other ways to play with that, right? Got the purple and yellow over here. Let's do a couple more on the bottom, and I'm going to finish up here real soon. Well, it's 11:15 already at my time, so we're actually going to finish up in the last five minutes here. Uh, I do apologize because um, we do have to break away soon. I'm opening up my classes for registration here, so thank you guys for joining in. I do appreciate all of you guys' interest, questions, and curiosities. I hope to see some of you in classes that are interested. If you do take it. Uh, for those of you that don't, it'd be great if you guys would help me share the information, you know. Uh, if you have family or people that you know that are interested in taking art classes and have always wanted to take some, that would help me a lot. Because I want to spend as much time as I can to help you guys in terms of, you know, anything I can give. Um, but yeah, anything that can help me out would be just to share information. Um, 
and to keep this going from my end because uh, it's something I truly love doing. And I hope to see you again, like I said, a continuation of this. Uh, but if anything else, like I said, I'll be back on next time. I'm hoping next week around the middle of the week. Possibly Monday. We'll see. I'll ask, answer these last couple of questions before we go. Um, you probably heard this before, but I'm thinking of attending courses for entertainment design at Art Center while I enjoy it. Uh, and while I enjoy it, I worry about the financial side of things. People online have compared being a professional concept artist to being a pro athlete. How bad is, com is the competitiveness for employment for people even out of a good schools and fields like Art Center or Sin Studios or CDA, etc.? So you're not at Art Center. But in terms of the competitiveness and also that comparison of a pro athlete, it's a good analogy. I would say that's a probably proper in terms of thought. Uh, you are training like that, essentially. You know, And to be professional, think of it as being a pro athlete it's elite level to some of them however it's a little bit more forgiving of course you know because people who are just starting in the field of concept art you're not supposed to be elite from the beginning you you show the potentials of being that in that position and so you're able to fill those roles through more experience more time and more guidance so you continue to learn and build your experiences in the working field as well but you got to show that you not only show competitiveness in your work but in who you are as a person so how you speak to people how well you engage how well you network how well you connect those are just as important as i mentioned earlier as to the work you produce so if you only rely on technique and art or the portfolio of the actual skills to get you the job it may not be enough it'll only get you so far you have to develop also yourself so to do this requires a couple of things, which is the right people around you, the potential, the right environment, uh, and of course, patience and maturity. You got to mature into that position as well, too. Right now, you might be very young. You might be in your teens, 20s. You're very young at this point. But you could also be like, well, I'm in my 30s right now. Well, it's not too late, all right? You might already have a sense of who you are. But you might still need to uh, develop and blossom in this field. So give yourself a chance to also still explore, right? Uh, quite, again, add a question here was how did your parents or family feel about your interest in art and how did that change? They completely backed me. Again, that was one of the things I felt very fortunate about. They didn't pull me away from it. Um, they only took me more opportunities to actually have chances to explore that. Uh, even at a very young age, they would take me to like drawing tutorial workshops and you know we would do college visits when I was very young in my teenage years. Uh, they did this for me. And they were very much okay with me developing that because, again, like I said, since the age of when I was very young, uh, I, I drew nonstop. And I showed, you know, all the stuff I would ever do in my interest of things. I'm sure there were worries. I'm not going to say there weren't. But I think they were confident enough that they could see that I was 100% committed. Okay, well, that's the last of the questions. Again, I, I really do appreciate you guys' um, enthusiasm and energy and, and also being here to give not only to me but to others because your guys' questions also potentially hits to similar uh, paths and interests that others have here as well too. And it can only help um, enlightening everyone. Also for me. So next time I see you guys, hopefully it'll be another live stream. Uh, this will be for subscribers on Twitch available immediately. But for YouTube, this will be put up probably in about a week and a half later. Um, but enjoy the rest of the evening and the weekend, you guys. Um, yeah, I'll see you next time. Cool, appreciate it.